The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Office Ergonomics for Remote Workers, presented by our sponsor, Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Amanda Ramatar and I will be your moderator today. And I'll also be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All the webinar materials we discuss can be found at the URL currently showing on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. We do not control the audio. Your devices control the audio. So if you are having audio difficulties, try adjusting the volume settings on your device. If a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative number to call in. Feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you are using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout and the presenters will be answering questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number of upcoming webinars covering a variety of topics, including those listed at the, bottom, um, at the Heffernan web, webinar website. In addition, we offer the mandatory preventing harassment training in English three times a year. With that, let's begin today's webinar, Office Ergonomics for Remote Workers. Well, thank you, Amanda. This is Steve Thompson, and it's great to be here. I'm going to be joined by my part partner in crime, uh, Diane Probert. Diane, would you like to say hello to our audience? Hello, everyone. Welcome. We look forward to a great presentation today. And again, if you have any questions during the presentation, go ahead and put them in your question or chat box, and we will get to them. That sounds great. I'm just going to go ahead and get my presentation up and running. Uh, I had a little bit of a hiccup here. Looks like it opened up my, my incorrect presentation. So let's bring that up right now. Okay, I'm going to put that on the screen. Uh, and always, it's always great to be back uh, with our with our audience at Heffernan because because I'm you you are just the absolute uh, over the top audience. As a matter of fact, every time we've done every time we've done a webinar. Uh, we have great Heffernan, you know, client and member involvement, engagement. And uh, I just wanted to say hello to you, put myself on screen for a moment to say uh, it's great to have you. It's great to be here. And uh, I'll come on and off during the screen as to describe a few things here and there. But let's go ahead and get started. So let me close myself. Out. Okay, we're going to discuss uh, remote work uh, opportunities today and, and how uh, ergonomics is engaged in that process, and uh, we've always shared in our sessions that we we really love what we do. We love every day. Uh, Diane and I actually love presenting about ergonomics and being a part of, of this world and, and helping people work safer um, and more healthy. And we we would like to know a little bit more about you. As, as you know about us, we've been doing ergonomics for about 20 years. And uh, we, our, our whole mission and goal is to create ergonomic well-being. But we're going to launch a polling question. And Amanda, if you can launch our first polling question uh, to, to share with the audience to tell, them, tell us a little bit about themselves. And we really want to get a chance to know, you know, are you working from home, uh, you know, or remotely for a year or less? Are you, are you an experienced pro for greater than a year? Maybe you're doing hybrid right now little bit the for working at home and virtual I would consider hybrid maybe you know more than uh, once a week going into the office um, I, I know that's a tough one to kind of come down and then we have another category and we'd love to hear you 
put something in your chat box or otherwise to tell us what other means. So we appreciate you sharing uh, your a little bit about yourself. And I know, Amanda, we've got, again, a great effort and audience, always responsive. I mean, instantaneously, they usually get to a 70 to 80 percent voting in very little time. Yeah, at the moment, we're at 73 percent voted. So we're almost at that 80 percent that we can we can start to look at the results. Oh, there we are. Awesome. So the results are 8% are working from home or remotely for one year or less. 35% um, are experienced pro working from home greater than one year. 37% are hybrid work from home, virtual and traditional office. And 18% are other. Okay, well, thank you for that. I, and by the way, Amanda, I went ahead and shared that with the audience by closing and sharing. And um, so just just a just a, a note there. I was able to put it on the screen, and I'm going to go ahead and hide that out, and we're going to continue on with our presentation. Okay, so uh, many of you that have been working in sort of a traditional environment, are well familiar with all of the normal stuff that goes along with ergonomics. You've probably taken courses and classes on the subject, and you probably had some uh, brief knowledge and education in the subject. We're going to ask a question in a moment about where you, um, you know, where you fit in this in this information about ergonomics. But today we're going to cover the non-traditional. We'll, we will talk about desks and 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 chairs and traditional chairs, but we're also going to cover all of the non-traditional stuff. That people are doing working remotely and it's not just you know from home people are working remotely at, at the library or they're working uh, you know on a train or they're working in a plane they're working all different places in a remote environment today you'll hear some of the same stuff that you've heard but you might hear some alternatives like um, we talk about alternating the mouse between the right and left hand and we'll cover later on this this intersection between personal and professional activities uh, you'll see uh, a graphic that Diane will show, which will really take us uh, really, really point home as to what we mean by that. Working remotely or virtually requires us to look at a few things and to look at them a little bit differently. And the first is, how do we get into a position of function and comfort working remotely? And the position of function is typically referred to as a medical term, which is somebody breaks their arm or they, you know, they, they have a problem with their joint and they immobilize it or they put a splint on it to, so that it heals and it, it's in the position of function. You certainly wouldn't put a finger splint on with your finger bent all the way back or in an awkward position. You would put it in the position of function. And when it comes to ergonomics, that's what we're going to strive for, a position of function. The other thing that we, we, we like to express, and we'll have some images later on, and that is everybody's built differently. And there is no one person who has the same body type or otherwise. And so if we were to make ergonomic recommendations, you know, generalized for everyone, which is what the National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health used to do, uh, we would be vastly, um, you know, underserving uh, those people working remotely or working virtually. We also have learned and studies have shown that moving and fidgeting and readjusting is a good thing. We used to put people into one spot, sit in that chair for the whole part of the day, and you, you'll just be you know, the, the ergonomic poster child. But that's not true anymore. We realize that it's okay to move in different parts of the chair and to, and to make adjustments. And if your feet aren't you know, moving underneath the chair right now, it's okay, let them fly. If your hands are in one spot, it's okay, let them fly. We're gonna talk a lot about posture and you'll see some images that will demonstrate a couple of that things. And then you can see the rest of the items on here about staying well hydrated, uh, taking a posture break, and we'll explain what that looks like a little bit later on. We'll also have some materials, as Amanda said, we've got some great materials that we'll share with you. And then alternating that mouse between the right and the left hand about every 30 days. Well, working remotely can, can make us more comfortable, but there are people who have shared with us about keeping routines and 
making sure that they get up in the morning, do their normal stuff, make their coffee, take shower, do whatever, get dressed. All those factors as part of their, their routines when they're working remotely because it helps keep productivity going forward. So we've heard some folks say, yeah, I was pretty casual at the beginning, but now I've, I've got myself worked out, so where I'm supposed to be. We also hear that there are animals and little creatures uh, that, that are part of everyone's uh, home, many, many people's home life. And of course, everybody's had an experience or a close call, I should say, where one of your furry creatures has stepped upon your your keyboard and that email that you were writing that you weren't ready to send or maybe it was when you were very angry it got sent by accident because kitty came and stepped on the keyboard or you had a whole bunch of c's or a's that you didn't expect in that report that you were working on we've also put a link here uh, for those of you that may still be in areas where your children are home because of covid or Maybe your school has uh, recommendations or they'll have various pandemic emergencies where children will be from home. It's certainly a challenge and we've included um, Yale's tips on uh, tips from working from home. And there are others out there. These just happen to be ones that we felt pretty good about and seemed to make sense. All right, we have another polling question for you and I'm gonna ask that Amanda put that up on the screen and we'd love to hear your, you rate your ergonomic knowledge. So go ahead and let us know where you feel you rank in this particular category. Don't hold back. Um, we know that uh, we, we know we're not expecting everyone to be an awesome expert or otherwise, but we'd love to hear where you feel that you're at. And Amanda, if we get to 70, 75 um, percent, I would feel perfectly comfortable with closing that poll because we know this audience is moving as quickly as they possibly can. Right, we are there. If you want to close that and then share it with the audience, thank you. Wow, so how do we rate uh, ergonomic knowledge? We do have an awesome expert or two or three or however many on the call, and we always welcome our awesome experts to please share your knowledge in either the chat or question box as we go through, especially if you see something on screen. 38% uh, on average, and then 43% using improvement. Some of you are in your early stages, and then some not sure. That's perfectly fine. We understand that, and uh, that's the beauty of a session like this is we get a chance to have uh, a whole cross-section of people with different experiences. Okay, well, we're gonna start off with sort of a little bit of traditional, but that traditional is going to look different to you because our traditional includes all the things we do at work. Secondly, all the people you see in the photos are pretty much friends, family, or consultants on the, on the Heffernan, Aspen, Ergo Healthy team, and they've all wanted to uh, participate and demonstrate in some way. So you'll be seeing uh, maybe even some familiar faces. So in this case, our consultant, even though she had a broken arm, you could see that uh, splint on, the, on, the left, uh, on her left arm. She came out to demonstrate what it's like to sit on the couch and again, this is only good for a few seconds. Now we're gonna show you some negative images along with some positives because we think the way that the brain uh, you know, works is to be able to see some stuff not to do and then to how to correct it. So you can see how this is all just problematic here. Uh, she's sitting sideways, her body's twisted, her legs aren't supported, uh, just awkward postures all the way around. Uh, no, we're not, uh, we're not, uh, this is not a product placement. We received no funding for the advertisement of that can in the background. But you can see in this, in this photo a couple of things that are interesting uh, sitting at the kitchen table. First, you can see by sitting at the end of the kitchen table that this person's legs are not going to be able to go far enough in to be able to keep the shoulder back and the elbows in a 90 degree position. Uh, you can see that because there is a leg in the way of, of the kitchen table. Of course, they're using a hard wrist support, probably not needed in this photo. And yes, alcohol may impair your work product. In this particular case, our consultant, who is actually a former child model, he came out of uh, you know his his safety consulting gig and posed for a number of our photos. You'll see him here regularly. He's sitting at the kitchen bar area. 
and you can see the same challenges, and that is arms are forward, elbows are not at 90 degrees, he can't move closer to the bar because his knees will bash into the wall. He has pressure on his forearms from the edge. He's wearing a watch, which appears to be tight because his wrist looks a little bit swollen, which can happen towards the end of the day for many of us. So just a lot of things here that are problematic. Uh, one thing is though, he does have the mouse on the left-hand side so that he can rotate between the right and the left hand. And he is using a mouse with his laptop. But uh, those are just, uh, again, this is good for a few seconds to be able to do this. All right. Now, this is the new classical thinker look. You've probably seen this image before. People sitting, you know, on the couch getting ready to, to do some work on their computer. And certainly you can see all of the problems here about the outstretched arm on the right-hand side, the hyperextension of the right wrist, the neck. And, and shoulders just and back and not in very good, um, again, position. Uh, not the position to have. Of course, the thinker on the left is more traditional. Uh, that was certainly um, okay at the time because there wasn't really the, ex the extended work being done with the right hand. Here we have a more traditional desk with a traditional chair. Diane's going to talk a little later on about some of the specifics of this chair. What I'll bring about in this particular photo is two things. One is the fully outstretched arm, the right arm, using the mouse on top of the table. Again, pulling that shoulder forward like that is eventually going to cause some problems in the shoulders, the neck, the elbow, and the wrists. Certainly not a position you want to be in on a regular basis. And secondarily, the keyboard is not on the same plane as the mouse. And Diane will talk about this a little bit later on and the importance of having all of these things at the same plane. The ability to move, flex. You know, there was a time when we used something called a manual typewriter. For those of you not familiar with that, it is uh, an actual typewriter that you would have to actually press down on the keys to actually make an arm move up on the uh, paper and actually imprint on a ribbon that would go into, it would copy, you know, that metal little key would go through that ribbon and onto the paper. Well, back then, when these typewriters were fully uh, used all the time, there were very few ergonomic injuries. It's because people were moving their arms and there was constant uh, adjustment and things had to be, if things, there was a mistake, then mistakes were corrected in a different way. Today, all we have is a backspace and a delete key, and we stay in the same position for long periods of time. Here you can see pressure on the wrist. Uh, this, it's okay to be, work on a table like this, but you might want to use a small towel or a um, foam wrist support or something of that nature so that you get support there. In this particular case, we have uh, 1980s Joe Wall Street, Sitting on the couch, he's got his right wrist in a pretty extended, you know, hyperextended position. And you can see there's a neck strain. Shoulders are actually not too bad in this position. But um, uh, the other note here is that smoking and nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. So if you like to vape uh, or smoke or otherwise, hey, if it's your thing. Uh, but it can cause um, a vasoconstriction, which can also, let's say you have a back injury, shoulder injury, or otherwise, it can cut the oxygen uh, flow down to those particular areas because, um, because of the nicotine. Here we have someone in their kitchen, and yes, that is lactose-free milk, so that's a good thing, but they've got their left elbow in, ground into the tabletop, and they've got their right uh, uh, you know, forearm area also into the edge of the table. Not a good position for any sorts of long-term work. Here we have our actor model again. There he is in the bottom there with the family uh, hanging out using those television trays back in the 19, uh, 1950s and 60s. But this is one of those television trays also from 1965. And he's made this work for him a little bit. He can work an hour or so on this without a problem. As a matter of fact, you can see he's got his left leg supporting that very flimsy table uh, so that it, it, that it supports uh, that little laptop that's on there. 
he actually is resting his forearms on his legs, uh, which is not bad, and his forearms and elbows are not in a bad position. They do make television trays a little bit different today, and there's a photo of one in this photo, image here in the center. And notice that you can see that there's a laptop on it. Well, wouldn't it be great to just put the laptop where the book is and then use a mouse and keyboard so that you can uh, have your monitor at a much better level? So good ways um, to take a look at this. Again, short periods of time, it's okay to use. Here's our consultant with a broken wrist coming back out. She's now demonstrating her laptop on her you know, on her legs. And there's a couple of problems here, of course. I mean, we don't have to tell you that, you know, there's heat that's generated from that laptop. So it might be good to use a cutting board or a cookie tray or something like that, or maybe even a small pillow or towel, and then put the laptop on top of that thin cookie tray or something like that. Because you want to be able to have airflow. Laptops have little teeny tiny legs underneath and a little space of air underneath them so that they can stay cool and those fans can keep them cool. But there are a couple things here that you want to think about, including um, taking a stretch break every hour. And if you're concerned about electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic fields, uh, and you've probably read about that with some of the new 5G, 4G, of course, and then other types of activities that can cause that, cell phones and, and, and so forth. The way to minimize that is to keep the top of that laptop, which is generally where the antennas are. That would be in this very top portion here of the laptop, at least six inches from your body. That's what the FCC recommends. And in this case, it certainly is further than six inches away from her body. You can also keep your laptop unplugged or your device unplugged and not use the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and keep it away from your vulnerable parts of your body. And that generally takes care of any extra uh, waves that you might be concerned with. Most laptops today and most devices today have shown that you know, they, don't, they don't go beyond what the FCC recommends. Here's yours truly. Uh, sitting in on a, on a love seat using a pillow. And you can see that I've kept the, the actual display pushed back. And the reason that that is pushed back in that particular photo is so that, and, and that is so that that goes forward or backwards. And, and the reason we do that is so that you can adjust, you can adjust yourself uh, so that you don't have to put your neck in a forward position so that you can keep your neck and shoulders in a good position to work. Again, uh, using a small laptop tray, uh, these can be purchased for 15 to 25 bucks in you know, big box retailers. And I like to keep the front of my laptop elevated. That gives even more uh, airflow underneath the laptop and at the same time allows for my wrist to be in a good position. So there's a slight downward tilt. Whoops. Judge Judy there with the laptop, making her best effort to, uh, to get that thing open. But uh, in this case, you can see our, our friend is, is, uh, is got her display actually a little bit forward. She actually uses trifocals. And so in this particular photo, when she goes to look at her display, it should be okay. But otherwise, her body's in pretty good position, shoulders, elbows, all in pretty good, good shape. So, Again, a couple of hours in this position is not bad, remembering to take a stretch break and fidget and wriggle and move around on a regular basis. Diane will talk about chair positioning here a little bit later, but this is just a demonstration working at the kitchen table. I happen to live in a tiny house, so there's not a lot of space around. In this particular case, we're using a simple laptop riser, which is, I don't know, 15 to, again to 25 bucks, and rotating the mouse between the right and the left hand. We also use typically smaller keyboards that so that when we move the mouse to the right hand side, uh, we can keep that mouse a little closer to the body. But if you are a person that does a lot of 10 key work or otherwise, uh, it's okay. You just have to be conscious to move that keyboard a little bit to the left. Or maybe you want to get a separate, uh, you know, 10 key that you could just move down when you get ready to use it. Here's our actor model demonstrating sort of on a typical, you know, workplace setup. 
You can see the shoulders are in good position. The elbows are looking good. Watch is still a little tight on that left wrist. Um, and then the mouse is on the left-hand side. Here's a couple of our consultants demonstrating another type of uh, keyboard setup and, and uh, monitor setup. In the photo in the center of your page, you can see that our consultant is actually using her her second her her laptop as a second monitor, and using that as actually a small work uh, sort of a, a worktop that she can put her work on. She's just using a Post-it note to hold pull it as sort of a document holder. She likes to use a split keyboard, and some people do like a uh, split keyboard. Uh, we don't recommend them right out of the gate, but some people um, prefer them depending on their body style. And she also has a small keyboard pullout. She happens to be shorter, so for her body, it works for her. We don't typically recommend keyboard pullouts uh, unless you know it's the only way to get you situated. We'd much ha rather have a person on a big platform where everything can be moved around. And you can see that our consultants are using a footstool or in one case, a, a small ream of paper so that they can get those, uh, get those hips and uh, knees in the right position, which Diane will cover a little bit later. And then we have a polling question for you. Amanda, would you like to launch our next polling question? Would you? Thank you. Okay, we're gonna, we'd like to know about the types of tools that you use for work. Now, in this particular question, you can, you can pick all that apply. This is a multiple, uh, this is a multiple answer question. So if you use a laptop only, we'd like to hear about that. Um, I think this is a multiple. Hopefully this is a multiple choice. Yeah. So you can choose as many of these that apply to you. If you use your smartphone, uh, you know, for work at all, checking email, uh, doing a search online for work or otherwise, you know, just simply mark that. If you use a tablet at any time. Those of you that are clicking on the other box, we always love to hear what that really means because we know that some people are using smart devices like watches. Uh, even some of you are using other devices to check posture connected to your watches. So we'd love to hear what that is. So take a moment in your either your question or chat box and let us know what that means. And Amanda, I think we can close this poll out. And if you can share it with our audience. Wow, so uh, we do have a, a large percentage of you using your smartphone. This is about what we usually see coming up. We're going to talk about smartphone safety later on. Uh, laptops only, almost 30% of you, and then 83% of you using some sort of laptop with an extended uh, external keyboard and mouse. Terrific. Good to hear that. And then the others, again, please let us know what they are. We would always love to hear about tech that people are using. Okay, thank you very, very much. I'm going to go ahead and hide that poll, move back into our presentation, and introduce Diane, who's going to take us to very quick five steps, real easy, about how to set up your workstations, whether they be remote or in an office. Diane. Well, thank you, Steve. And looking at our polling uh, question, it looks like, as Steve said, uh, over 80% of our audience today are working with um, a laptop or a computer that has external items. That's awesome. So we're going to go through the five steps, as he said. And the first step we're going to do, because probably most of you are sitting on a seat right now. So we are going to start with that seat known as your chair. And we just want to give you some advice and some tips on best practices. So you want to make sure that the chair is a good fit for your body. So as Steve had said earlier, you know, we're not all built the same. Some of us are tall, some of us are a little shorter, some of us are thin, some of us aren't so thin. So you want to make sure that the chair is a good fit for you. And you want to take a look at um, the lumbar support, support and then also the depth of the seat. So one thing I, I like to tell uh, people when I'm doing a um, remote ergonomic assessment is just um, lean down right now in your chair, everyone, and put your hand down and see how much space do you have from the back of your knee to the front of your seat on your chair. And we usually like to say we'd like to have about three to four fingers worth. So if you've got a lot more than that or not as much as 
not as much as that, then you might want to readjust your chair or um, sit a little differently or perhaps get a different um, type of chair. Also, for some people, if you're working from home or you're sharing a chair and maybe that person doesn't have the same body structure as you, and make sure that you adjust your chair each time before you sit down. And one thing for the height, if you can see here on the right hand side, it's showing the knee height as well. So that's another way to just kind of look and see if that's going to be a good fit for you. So once you've got your chair picked out, then we're going to go to step one, and that's going to be to adjust the seat height so that you can get into good positioning with your arms. And as you can see here in this photograph, we want to get you close to a 90 degree angle. And I like to think about it as lining up your ear, your shoulder, and your elbow in one line, and then your elbow, your wrist, and your hand in the other line. And for some of us that aren't great with degrees, I also think about it as an L. So sometimes I'll see people um, that will send me photographs and their shoulders will be way back far behind their elbows. We want to get you up and sit it up into a good 90 degree angle or as close as you can. And you want to be on a good um, horizontal plane with your forearms. So you just want to be straight across. You don't want your wrist higher than your elbows or lower than your elbows. So keep that in mind. Then the second step is we're going to take a look at your lower half of your body, and it's the same concept. Again, we want to look at those 90 degree angles. So you want to have your hips and your knees and your legs in one line, and then your knees going down to your feet. And I like to think about it as a squatting position. So you want to have your legs and your feet supporting you. If you went down into a squat without a chair and you were either leaning too far forward or too far back, you would fall back down on the ground. So we don't want to do that. So just kind of think about going down to that squatting position and have someone just push a chair right underneath you and you should be able to be really good. As Steve had said, for some of us that are maybe a little shorter, and once you get your arms in a good position, you might find that your feet are dangling and you don't want that. You want them well supported. So you can use a footrest or paper reams, anything like that so that you can get um, those legs up. Because what you can find is if you don't aren't in a good position, you'll start to feel a little bit of um, pressure and discomfort in your lower back. But when you've got your uh, feet up and supporting you, that's going to help you. Then the third step is take a look at the seat back positioning. So in most cases, you do want the chair um, back up and you want to be able to um, lean back against it and be again in that good positioning so that it can support you. Now, some people like to sit up and away from the chair, and that's fine. You can go back and forth, in fact. But as you can see Steve here illustrating, when some, for some people that may not have the abs of steel that I call uh, Steve Thompson, uh, you might start to fatigue sitting like that, and then your posture could go down, and then your whole um, positioning could get a little wonky. So you can, again, if you start to fatigue, then just kind of sit back and have the support of that back. And if you have a chair that has some lumbar support, just make sure that it's in a good positioning to um, support the small of your back. And then we're gonna go to step four. That's to look at the monitor and the screen positioning because that's super important. So when you are looking straight ahead at your monitors, you want to be able to look and see about the top third of the screen depending where your work is. So you may be looking up and over it, or you may be looking down. We don't want to have to lift your head, head up or down. So we want that neck in as much neutral position as we can. If you're using more than one monitor, if you're using them equally, then you want to set up everything in the middle. If you're using one more than the other, then you want to go um, closer to the, in the front of that monitor. And you want to have your keyboard and your mouse um, as close to each other as possible, as Steve talked about earlier, and you want that centered in front of the monitor. So again, when you're doing that, you're looking straight ahead and you're looking, you're, everything's looking good. Whereas if you had it over to the side, you'd be having to twist and we want to eliminate having to do those twisting moments. And then as far as for the distance, um, you want to have it in a comfortable reading um, position. And the bigger the monitor is, the farther away you're going to need to be. So keep that in mind as well. And then the fifth step, Again, it's just what we had been talking about is eliminating that awkward neck posture. And some of us uh, may be attending a lot of Zoom meetings, taking notes, things like that, and then you have to transcribe those notes. So one tip that we like to say is to use some sort of a document holder that can get those documents up as you're referencing them and then typing on and looking at your monitor. So there's a couple different kinds. You can use a slant 
monitor a uh, slant holder as you can see here in the picture and um, that's if you have a lot of documents a book something like that a notepad if you have just a couple of loose papers you can um, I like the kind that clip on right to the side of your monitor so again that even is better because then you could just kind of glance to the side at your notes and then look back at your screen but either one will work and either of these are better than having the paper down on the flat on your um, desktops so that you have to bend your neck down a lot to see it. So having said all that, now we're going to move on to the cell phone and the tablets. And 55% um, of our audience today is using a phone for work, but I would gather to um, believe and bet on the fact that a lot more than that are using cell phones and our tablets away from work and your ergonomic positioning is important at work and away from work as well. So we're just gonna go over real quickly just some things to do and to not do. So uh, we've all seen the virtual uh, videos of someone walking while they're looking down at their phone as you can see the man is on the right here. And the next thing you know, you're in the fountain and everyone's you know, your next viral sensation. We don't want to do that. So having to look down at your phone and tilt your neck down, that's fine for a few seconds to just scan an email, but it's not something that you want to do for a long time because again, you've got that neck down. So a better situation would be to hold up the phone so that you are not having to bend your neck to look down at it. They have a new thing now they're calling tech neck where we're getting wrinkles from our neck. I'm not as concerned about the wrinkles as the actual health of your neck. So holding it up will help you. And it also, you're gonna start feeling fatigue in your arm and that's gonna trigger you to move a positioning versus if you just had your neck down for a while, it's gonna take a while till that neck starts really hurting. And also something to consider is our phones are getting bigger and bigger and um, our hands are not getting bigger. So some of us may have smaller hands and if you're gripping around the side of a very large phone for a while, you can start to feel some fatigue in your hand. So you might think about adding a pop socket. As you can see here, she's got a little cute little Minnie Mouse one. And that just helps you to be able to just slide your hand around it and hold it through your fingers versus having to grip it. And then also if you're using a tablet for work, you might consider getting some sort of a stand so that again, it wouldn't be flat on your desktop that you can look down at. But you basically want to move while you're doing this and looking and take breaks. And also think about moving. Moving is the key, right? So move it or lose it. We're gonna move while we're also looking at our phones and our tablets. And then here's just some examples of a little better posturing. And you can see, you know, use something to support your hand while you're holding your phone, if it's your knee or couch. And I love the graphic picture on the far right that Steve has put on here. Uh, you can clearly see uh, which position is this young girl going to feel better in after a while on her phone. On the right hand side, she's got nice posture and she's looking, you know, her neck is not flexed too much. On the left hand side, she's just in a whole world of hurt. So just keep, you know, keep that in mind when you're using your phone. And, you know, we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. And I'll just have to stop and think, okay, let's move positioning. Let's get in a little better positioning. So to summarize, here's just some best practices for your smartphone and your tablet. Um, you just want to make sure that um, you're mindful of your positioning. Also think about switching your hands from your left to your right. Um, especially if you're doing a lot of scrolling, that can be a lot of repetitive motion for one hand. So let the other hand rest and you know switch to your left hand for a while or vice versa. And think about if you're doing a lot of typing to maybe use your voice uh, to text and um, also maybe an external keyboard for your tablet if you're using that a lot with um, talking. And then over here on the right, we have the burden of staring at a smartphone. I love this information because it really makes you think. So if you can see here in the graphic, it starts out in a, just a zero degree straight ahead and you got the, you know, the weight of your head, average 12 pounds. And then with each degree that you go down, you can see that the weight on the spine can just keep getting immensely stronger and stronger until you're all the way down to the red. And then you could have the equivalent of an air conditioner on your back. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound too exciting or fun. So just be careful when you're using your phone or your tablet that just be mindful of your positioning.
And I think we have a polling question. We do, Diane, thank you very much. And thank our you. next polling, polling question has a little bit of honesty um, from our audience to try and um, actually, can we launch the other poll? Can we close this one and launch the other poll? We want to launch the poll which has the position of the neck. Sorry, it must be out of order. Can you do that one, Amanda? Thank you very much. So we want to get a sense of where you feel your neck position is what's most common for you using a phone or tablet. Sorry about that questionnaire. That's my fault. And it's okay, this isn't going anywhere other than into the vast uh, swath of information I am going to share with you for the last two years, we've actually been collecting these things. We don't know who's who these people are. We don't know who you are. All this stuff is just anonymous, but we'd love to hear where you feel you're at. And it's more of a of being cognizant of, you know, the position that your neck is in. Um, and when, you know, for, for the, on the average, where, you know, it's most common for you when you're using a phone or tablet. Okay. I think we can close this one out, Amanda. Won't we do that? Okay, so 30 degrees, uh, 48, 43% of everybody. So we've got a few people um, that are heading into the danger zone from, uh, you know, a Top Gun movie there, 43, 16, and 7% up into that area. Many of you reaching for neutral and 15 degrees out of the gate. Very good. Appreciate that. Good stuff. How do you compare? Well, we've We've been collecting this for the last, you know, two years. We've done, we've probably had thousands of people on our webinars. And you can see where about the general population has been on this question, 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees. So, you know, close, although there's a few more of you into the, uh, into the higher levels uh, here with the, with the more, um, you know, flexion. Something to be aware of, something to be concerned about, and something you want to train and talk with your family about. If you have children or friends or a significant other, and you see that they're, you know, constantly operating in this position. Now, look, in the number of generations, we will adapt to this. We, pro we may just grow up as people with bent over necks. I mean, it's possible that in, you know, it usually takes about six generations to be able to adapt you know, from a, from a physical perspective. So maybe in six or seven generations, we will naturally have the ability and perhaps we even not stand quite up in the same way that we do because of this technology. So it's just something to be aware of, uh, something to be concerned because these can lead to neck and back problems. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about sit stand for a moment because that question usually comes up. And we'll, we'll first go to our one, well, not my favorite place. We do want to talk about a place that some people have gone in their lifetime, and that's a bar. And if you've been to a bar ever, you'll know that there is something called a bar rail. If you look closely at the 1912 photo there, you'll see on the far hand right hand side, you'll see, you'll see the gentleman there with his right leg up on that bar rail, and you'll see the guy in the center there who's picking up drinks. Uh, he's got his leg up on the bar rail. Well, there's a reason that there's a bar rail there, and that's so that it will benefit um, benefit the barkeep um, and not so benefit the the um, the patron. And the reason for that bar rail is so that you can stay there for long periods of time by elevating one leg over the other. It allows you to reduce the stress and pressure in your hips and your lower back. And so that's why you've got bar rails in these places. Now, let's talk about that as it relates to ergonomics, people sit stand, or those of you that like to stand and work. So first off, and we will cover uh, the standards that are, that are typically um, utilized in uh, the, the work environment today as it relates to how long should you stand, how long should you should sit, et cetera. So first, the best practices are to change positions frequently. That means between sitting and standing. Now, if you have a medical condition, and we've had probably uh, a couple of people over the thousands of, of people we've spoken to over the years about ergonomics that might be only able to stand because of a serious medical problem. And 
their doctors are generally aware of it. But for the most part, uh, it's recommended to move between both positions. You want to use some sort of footstool or footrest that's, you know, 6 to 12 inches, depending on your height. Of course, if you're a taller person, you'd use a taller, um, you know, support. And you'd alternate that foot between the right and the left foot. You want to avoid static postures, and you probably want to be on some sort of carpet or an anti-fatigue mat. If you're working on a hard floor, uh, like if you're in your garage or a hardwood floor at your home, you probably want to get an anti-fatigue mat or a small piece of carpet. Remember, if you do get an anti-fatigue mat, make sure that it's probably about a half inch. If you go much bigger, like three quarters of an inch or an inch, it'll feel like you're standing on sand. And trust me, if you've ever walked in sand, for long periods of time, you know how your legs and your back feel. You want to avoid uh, hunching forward, of course. And if you look at the photo on the right, this is an image that we had in the in the, um, in the uh, Union Tribune a couple of years ago. They asked us to design this. Everything from the waist above is the same as it is uh, for sitting at a computer. It's the waist and below that we need to think about and being able to adjust. Now there are some problems with prolonged standing, and we're talking about sedentary standing. We're talking about standing in one place for long periods of time. We have lots of studies that look at uh, factory workers and others who stand for long periods of time, and there are health risks, things like blood clots, uh, varicose veins. Other types of things can happen by standing in, in the same place for long periods of time. So you want to be extra aware of that uh, when, you're, when you're doing any kind of standing work. Cornell University, they're the leaders. They've done a ton of studies in, in ergonomics, especially office and remote work. And you can, here's their recommendation if you're gonna do sit-stand. They measure in 30-minute periods. So in a 30-minute period, want to sit for 20 minutes, stand for eight, and then two minutes of standing and or moving, standing and moving. So the key part of this is moving or changing positions. What's generally recommended though is sitting for, you know, and making sure you're fidgeting and moving in your chair, and then standing uh, in a stretch break, moving, not standing at a sit, at a sit stand workstation where you're standing. Rather than getting, rather than sitting and going to standing and doing the same thing, you'd be sitting and then getting up and stretching and moving and doing other aspects. So, you know, that are different. Let's talk about away from work real quickly. Many people that we talk to say, you know, it just feels like I'm spending so much time at work, and especially for those of us working remotely. You know, we get up, we go right to the workstation, and then we're working, and it just feels like we're working forever. A typical 40-hour work week is 76% of our time is away from work or off of work, and 24% is on work. And that's a simple calculation, 40 hours. It's 168 hours in a week, average 40 hours that's 24% of your life or 24% of your week. If you were then to take in vacations and holidays and retirement at the end of your life, then certainly it would be less time at work. But the problem is we have sleep that's filled into here. So then we have, you know, uh, waking hours. But if we again take the full, full measure, we don't want to dismiss our away from work activities. So now we can ask that next question. Amanda? Unfortunately, I don't know that I can launch a question that's been closed. So um, the the question I think you had hoped for this particular spot is, is closed out. Um, no problem. I'm going to go ahead and just launch the social media question for everybody. So let's just have everybody take a moment to share with us what kind of social media or professional online media do you use? Um, and you just take a minute to, to let us know where you're at in this category. And we only need to get to about 50% on this one, Amanda, for, uh, for time purposes. And it takes a little while to answer this one because we've got multiple uh, answers. And some of you, we always ask if you complete the other, we'd love to hear what's out there because we try to stay on top of this social media, but you know, there are, we've like, uh, we've just heard about YouTube and, and then not just heard about it. We heard about alternatives like Rumble and then we Instagram came out. And so there's just more that continue to come out. So, Amanda, we can go ahead and close that poll and share it with our audience. That would be great. 
Okay, so 44% of our audience uh, uses some sort of Facebook or Instagram, 16%, 33% LinkedIn, which is obviously a professional network. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hide that, close it and take you to the next slide. The reason we ask is that these tasks, these social or, or professional you know, activities are generally done in a sedentary position. As Diane said earlier, you know, you don't want to be walking along the road or near train tracks while you're doing these kinds of activities. You'll be the next viral sensation. But there really has been an explosion of this. As a matter of fact, 58% of the country is engaged in gaming, whether it's on your computer or phone or other methods. And these types of things take time. It could be a half hour a day, an hour a day, two hours a day. Uh, they used to do studies on how much television a person watched over the course of their, you know, day or week. And now, if we were to add television in with these other sedentary activities, we'd be pretty significant numbers. So we have to be uh, conscious of making sure that the things we take away for our work environment, the, the activities are integrated into our, you know, our off work activities. So for instance, if you wanna leave the clicker in the kitchen or most of the snacks, so if you get a snack in a small bowl, not the whole bag, so that you've got to get back and forth, go into the kitchen, pick up things, come back. You want to break up that time so that you're not in that sedentary position all the time. If you go from work sedentary to home sedentary, now you've got yourself 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 hours of sedentary positions. We want to try to move from that because it's harmful. Lastly, there are some individual injury factors that can affect what happens from an ergonomic perspective. Uh, first off, uh, everybody's uh, body is built differently. And there have been some studies that show that women tend to have a higher incidence of musculoskeletal disorders. We, we don't know why, it just is. Uh, cigarette smoking or vaping or uh, those where nicotine's involved, um, those studies show that there can be a higher uh, relationship of pain in the extremities, including the neck and the back. We're not really sure, but most studies show that because of that nicotine, as I mentioned earlier, is a vasoconstrictor, can limit the amount of oxygen to a particular area. And for strength, uh, people who are weaker, and there were some studies done many years ago, probably not the best studies, that the average woman could lift 35 pounds over her head, the average male about 70 pounds. And for those people that could not do that, uh, they had um, a chance of injury three times higher. And then there's height, weight, body mass index. We don't know why those factors are there, but those can also indicate uh, increases in musculoskeletal disorders. And then physical activity, when there's been a lack of physical activity, can also increase a susceptibility to injury. And then on the right-hand side, if you will take your arms and just place them uh, at your side without uh, face, palms facing forward, Take a look and see what your elbow does. Does it curve out slightly or does it go straight down? Well, depending on what that looks like, may be a difference in the way you set up your keyboard because your body's just a little bit different. We don't always know the reasons why we're built that way and we can't, we can't know all the answers to that, but everybody's not the same. Lastly, we wanna talk a little bit about the things that are not ergonomics, especially if you're working remotely because the chance of fire, the chance of electrical cords, now you may have yourself and others working from home, be careful. This is the time to make sure you're using a surge protector with enough outlets. You don't want a daisy chain you know, onto extension cords, et cetera. Try to use surge protectors if you can. And you wanna keep flammables, you know, like clothes and, and trash and paper and stuff away from all this stuff. Certainly keep your heaters away from them. And I stepped on a Lego toy when my son was young. In the middle of the night, I stepped on it. It was terrible in my bare feet. I thought I was going to die in that moment. So you want to think about those kinds of things that could be in your work environment. And given that there are electrical increases to your little grid in your house with these things going on, might be time to check that smoke detector. You know, they're, they're good. You might check it once a year. And then if you don't have a fire extinguisher, maybe it's time to grab one of those. Okay, if you would for a moment, I'm gonna turn on my camera and I wanna ask you to share something. I want you to go to Hang the Arms. It's on the list here. It's about down there under CHA. You're gonna become an ergo champ. So go to Hang the Arms. I'd like you to take your arms, 
and just rest them at your side, just, just in the natural position. I'd like you to do that for the next 10 seconds. Just hold your arms for 10 seconds there. Okay, if you were to do that for 60 seconds every hour, you'll see a relaxation in your shoulders and your arms. And that's one of our tips that we would like to, you to take away today is just to rest those arms at your side for 60 seconds every hour, even if you don't stretch, even if you do nothing else, to just do that if you can. It's gonna give you a lot of relief. Your muscles will be relaxed. You'll be able to feel rejuvenated. But we'd love to all to become Ergo Champs. And on the board, we've got uh, all these items that are listed here. But think through about taking those short breaks, three to five minutes every 50 minutes to an hour. Uh, remember to remove those armrests if you have them on your chair. We typically either recommend moving them or putting them all the way down so they don't get in your way. And you don't, at the end of the day, you know, you're leaning on one side, which can be a problem. Remember to rotate your mouse every 30 to 60, every 30 days. But remember that it might not start off with you being able to do it that whole amount of time. You might start off small by taking the mouse, alternating it to the left hand, and then trying it out for 15 or 20 minutes a day. And remember, go into your settings and change the mouse to a left hand mouse, because you wanna be using this finger for your you know, major mouse finger, if that's the way that you do it now. So these are some techniques that we wanted to share with you about uh, becoming an ergo champ, and we would expect everybody on this line to be to, to be in that situation. And then we've got some some materials that we're going to be sending to you. But we want before we talk about that, we want to summarize again, remembering that this is the beginning of your journey in ergonomics. For those of you that said to us, you know, I'm just getting started. I'm right in the beginning, and this is an opportunity for you to take a few techniques away and set your journey, I guess you could call it true north, true ergonomic north. We have another polling question for you, and I think this question will come up. Uh, this is just, I'll go ahead and, and open this one up for you. How did we do today? Uh, we won't share the results with you, but we will. Sh we want to take away from this. We want like to know how we did today. We always, uh, and then we're gonna go right into a question asking you to, to identify one takeaway and um, and and what, what maybe a takeaway and any questions you may have from today. So thank you very much for participating today. We've got a couple more items, including some resources that are pretty terrific, and I know Diane will share those with you. All right, thank you very much for taking that time uh, for that. All right, so let's go ahead. If you can open up your chat or question box, whichever one you have access to, you might have a different one depending on your system. And just tell us one thing that you learned today, one takeaway, or if you have a question, certainly ask that at this time. While you're doing that, go ahead and give us one takeaway. I'd like to share with you the materials that we're gonna be sending out. Uh, Amanda will send an email out and there'll be a resource center where this can, you can get them, but she definitely will, this, this PowerPoint will be available to everyone in a PDF format. And then these are the other items that we'll have. The general ergonomic solutions, which is our sort of behind the scenes. Every consultant uh, that we have working with ergonomics has access to this. And then the stretch and flex. You don't have to be in the military to do their stretch and flex plan. It is remarkable. It is awesome. And then our own Kate Montgomery, who was a consultant here for so many years, is now retired. And she's a naturopathic physician, massage therapist, physical therapist. And she put together the 12 steps of self-care. Terrific for, for all of you to have. Of course, uh, we're going to um, have a copy of this presentation. And Diane, do you want to share a little bit about these next items? Oh, sure. So as we've talked about today, um, movement throughout your day is super important. And I know that we can get wrapped up in a project or have back-to-back -back meetings and we think about, oh my goodness, I haven't gotten up in like three, four hours. Well, we don't want that. So there are some reminder apps that you can add onto your phone. Um, here's just uh, some list of them. Also, you can look into, they have 
uh, programs that you can put on your uh, computer too. And a little guy jumps up and says, hey, it's time to move. And you'll like be so annoyed that you will get up. And I know that some of you may have that on your smartwatch as well. Um, just be mindful that it, that's good. But as uh, Steve had said earlier, if you are using jewelry or a watch, just be careful that it's in a good positioning and that it's not constricting you. Yes, and thank you, thank you, Diane. And Amanda, do we have any uh, takeaways from today's session or questions that come up? We sure do. Um, so every, well, we have a lot of takeaways. It's great, great feedback. Um, should we go over some questions right now? Or, yeah, um, we can cover the quest questions and, and yes, let's do that. Sure, I'm going to start with, um, this was in regards to a particular slide where the gentleman's arms are a little bit bent, I believe. And so the person inquired, um, the elbows are so low, is that bad? So uh, as it relates to the arms, you know, when you're sitting at your chair, you're really looking to have your arms in about a, an L shape like this. They can be like this slightly. They can be like that a little bit. It really is going to depend on your comfort level and where you're sitting. So there is a, as Diane said, the, the positioning of the elbows and the arms, what's really important is to have the shoulders in, in a back position, to not have them going forward. If you were to take your grip strength and you were to be in a position of function, which is your shoulders in good alignment, as Diane said, you know, ears on top of your shoulders and then your arms down. And if you were to squeeze as hard as you could, if you had a machine that showed your grip strength, if you checked your grip in this position versus your position in this grip, you'll notice about a 50% drop off. So being in this position allows this position of function and those elbows in that, you know, sort of 100 to, to maybe 85, 80 degrees, somewhere in that range. And you can definitely feel your grip strength as you change the positioning of your arms. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Any other questions at all? Yeah, so we have um, an inquiry on if you could basically give some insight on the handshake mouse and alternating hands on the mouse. Okay, sure. So alternating your mouse between the right hand and the left hand on a regular basis. We generally recommend every 30 days. And when you adjust your mouse to either the right or the left hand, you would go into your settings command and set it for a left hand mouse or right hand mouse, of course. Now, again, not everybody can just do this. It takes about 48 hours for your mind and your body to adjust to the mouse being on a particular side. Now, if you're a graphic artist, I would suggest that you not, you know, try to use your left hand as your new art, you know, artistic um, hand. But if you are uh, like uh, mostly professionals and doing keying, typing, etc. Uh, it's best to try and rotate that mouse. And you can use any kind of mouse, but it has to be obviously flexible enough to be able to go to the right and the left hand. We generally recommend a basic mouse. Some of you may have, you know, a different type of mouse device, and it has to be flexible enough to go between the right and the left hand. Hope that helps. Any other questions, Amanda? Yeah, um, they were wondering if you should tilt the monitor toward or away from yourself. Great question. That may have the tendency to deal with glare. When you offset your monitor just a little bit to either the right or the left or down or up, you can, uh, you know, moderate any glare that might be behind you. Like my office can have glare if these blinds are open. So I may want to modify my monitor slightly. The key part about monitors is that if you were to close your eyes and then open them, look where your natural position of sight is. You're not looking up in the air. You're not looking down at the floor. You're looking just slightly downward. That's why when Diane was saying, you know, it's, it's probably okay to have your eyes at about the level of the top of your monitor, but where's your work on the monitor? It's generally about the top third or top half of your computer. You're not looking down at the very bottom and you're not working at the very top on a regular basis. So that, that adjustment of where you look and how your monitor is, is structured, it's not gonna be an impact whether it's slightly tilted 
one way or the other or right or left, but it can be adjusted for glare. Any other questions at all? Yeah, we have quite a few actually. So you let me know when you'd like to cut it off. Um, no, we don't cut off questions. Keep we them don't rolling. cut them off. Awesome. We're going to keep going then. Um, so we have a question that is, what is the best way to share this level of detailed information with staff who are working remotely? And is there a self-assessment that they can perform? Yeah, the self-assessment. We, you know what? We don't have a self-assessment form that comes as part of this, but we can we can send something along in the in the package. Remember, a self-assessment is probably best in our five steps. Uh, that's probably the best way for people to to very quickly. And a matter of fact, I can't remember if that's included in this, but we will include that that five-step process, and then have people sign off that they've gone through it. So. The best way a lot of companies do is they'll provide the five steps, um, make it an op option to them. You know, if you have any questions about setting up your workstation, please let us know. And, you know, when you do your handbook, annual handbook, or you do your injury and illness prevention plan, people can sign off saying, you know, I have, I have reviewed the five steps setting up my workstation, I'm ready to go. Or if you've got an internal system, load the five steps on there and have people sign off. That might be one way to, to take care of it. Uh, from a self-assessment perspective. And Steve, if I could just interject, something else that um, I think could be helpful in that situation is to give the people the five steps, have them set up, but then kind of do a buddy system to have once the person thinks that they're in a good positioning, then have someone else look and see, because sometimes we're not even aware of what we're doing, right? I find that when I do my um, evaluations and people, you know, part of it is to have someone take a picture and then they see the picture and they're like, I had no idea that's what I looked like at my workstation. So doing a buddy system or even having someone take a picture so that you can see and then adjust um, is a good tip, I think. Yeah, my webcam takes photos, so they could be in a position like this, tilt the camera down, have some photos, do one from the side, how are they sitting at the workstation? Great idea, Diane. Anything else, Amanda? We have um, a question. What are your feelings on armrests on your office chair? Should you use them or not use them? We generally recommend removing them or lowering them to the point where they're not in the way because it can affect your ability to pull up to your to your table or your desk. Um, and it also can, at the end of the day, put you in a position where you're you're leaning to one side. Now you may need them to help move you up on the chair. We understand that but we generally recommend they're removed uh, when you get your new chair. If they can't be removed, then they'd be lowered as much as possible. If it's part of a fixed chair where they're not, they're just built in, probably time to think about a different chair. Okay. And then do handshakes, uh, handshake mouses need a wrist rest? Uh, I, I'm not sure what a handshake mouse is, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that it's the type of mouse that um, is some sort of track mouse device that your hand rests in and that it has a ball that you move it around. I think that's what we're talking about. Can you repeat the question? Um, it's just does it have a Amanda, can you just repeat the question? Yeah, there's no description of what a handshake mouse is, but do handshake mouses need a wrist rest? No, not no, not necessarily. It depends on the actual mouse device that it is. I mean, a track mouse can, you know, uh, you could use maybe a small, a thinner type of uh, device uh, that your hand could go on. You're really looking at pressure. Where's that pressure happening on your arm or your hand? Um, in it, that's really what's going to be the determinant. If you find that you know you're having a rubbing sensation while using that particular track mouse or otherwise, or even a vertical mouse, you know, where, where is the position where it could be potentially causing a problem where it's rubbing against the table? So I hope I've answered that. I, I guess I haven't heard the term before. It's something I learned today. I, I know them as a track mouse. Okay, anything else, Amanda? Yeah, and I think we did have a little feedback confirming that it is the same as a track mouse. Okay, good. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Um, no, but we had, you know, some lovely feedback. So did you want to share that information? Perfect. No, that's fine. We always love to see the takeaways that people had. We want to thank everybody for being a part of today's session. Amanda, I don't know if you have any closeout to do, but uh, I, on behalf of Diane, I want to thank the, our audience uh, for a great day today. Awesome. Yes, I do. Just 
a quick little thank you to everyone for atten uh, attending the webinar today. We're going to be sending information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. And we, of course, want to thank Steve Thompson again for your time and expertise. Um, we hope all of everybody or all the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of time. And we'd love for you guys to join us on February 1st for our webinar called Training Employees Remotely. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. And thank you, Diane, for joining me. Thank you, Amanda, for hosting. Take care, everyone.